Hey, everybody! Welcome to Bible Study That Doesn't Suck. I am Pastor Megan Rohr in San Francisco at Grace Lutheran, and our website is www.gracesf.com. We worship every Sunday at 10.30 a.m. live and on the live stream. And, yep, we're working on our uh, succulent Lenten Labyrinth Garden this month again, so if you like gardening, come on by. In Colorado is... Hi, I'm Pastor Dan Tisdell. I am at First Lutheran Church in uh, in Gypsum along I-70. Um, we have our we have one worship service at 9 a.m. on Sunday morning, and lots of other fun stuff that's going on. Wednesday nights we have uh, Wednesday night live, or we have a simple supper, and um, we talk about topical things. We do a Bible study, and uh, it's a, a great community, and come uh, come be a part of it. Our, our website is and our Facebook page are both First Lutheran of Gypsum, all one word. So uh, come check us out. And, and I am. Oh, oh, it! I totally stepped on your cross, like toss over. Sorry about that. I'm Pastor Amanda Zentz Allo. I serve at Central Lutheran Church in Northeast. Portland, Oregon, and our worship service is at 10.15 on Sunday mornings. You can join us live in the building or live online at our website at centralportland.org. And Wednesday nights, we do have Lenten events happening. 5.30 is soup, and then we have a class, and then we have hold an evening prayer, and it's lovely. And those things are also live streamed, so you can join us from the ether if you choose. Ta-da! Dun, da, da, da. So this week we all think that the verses are stupid, <laughs> but we're trying to have a good attitude about them. Uh. Maybe, maybe we'll do our best. Uh, so the first we'll start with the gospel reading from John. Um, I, John's not my favorite. John's kind of a poetic, hard to understand gospel. If it's the very first one you ever read, it says riddles that sound like the Beatles, like I am he and you are he and we are he forever. And um, John is more interested in teaching theological principles about light and life and as a Gnostic text thinks maybe there are magic words that will get you into heaven and that you should learn those magic words through repetition and strange poetry. <laughs> <laughs> and that's my biased understanding of John. Uh, the thing that is interesting in the text for this week that you might not know if you're not a read the Bible every day or go to church a lot kind of thing is there's a couple of things that have happened before this text is read that will shape the way you read this particular section. First, um, in this gospel, Jesus has resurrected Lazarus from the dead. So, um, Lazarus is kind of a smelly, was dead for a couple of days, but now walking around and will die again person. And um, Mary and Martha are um, two interesting characters who have previously yelled at Jesus in the way that family can yell at each other. They were clearly very close and are not afraid of this Messiah guy caring that they are yelling because they're very upset when Jesus lets Lazarus die because they think he should have come sooner and not uh, let him die at all. And um, so what is happening in this text is a couple of things. First, um, having it be so close to International Women's Day, knowing these women are able to host Jesus and put a substantial amount of money, basically an entire year's wages, into perfume to anoint Jesus, tips you off that Jesus' ministry is not a ministry that's paid for by radio call-ins and bugging people until they raise, raise the pledges for the year, right? Jesus' ministry is not paid for by the oil lobbyists. It's not a Donald Trump self-funded campaign. Jesus' ministry is funded by wealthy women who don't seem to have husbands in the story, which is a rare and strange thing, but also pretty kick-ass. Um, and all of the conclusions maybe that the disciples came to or the followers of Jesus came to that women aren't as important is 
pretty much dumb because they were the folk who made it possible for Jesus to travel. They were the ones who paid for what Jesus was up to. They were the ones who took the time to anoint Jesus' body for burial. And they were the only ones who had the gall, not in John's Gospel. In John's Gospel, the Beloved takes a trip to check out Jesus. But the women were the ones who had the courage to go check if the body was really dead. They're the ones who witnessed the resurrection, and they're the ones who continue talking about the gospel later when the disciples are hiding and cowering in shame in a dark, empty room, arguing about whether or not you can touch Jesus. So this is a story that, as strange as it is, says a lot for the power of women. And this here is an alabaster perfume jar, or a replica of it. You'll notice it's shaped like something in Greek society that was thought to have power and that presidential candidates are arguing about the size of their hands. <laughs> so there is kind of a sexual nature to what's happening. I always wondered because um, the word feet in ancient Jewish tradition also meant private parts. Um, you can think about what it means when the unnamed woman, not in John's Gospel, but in other texts, it's an unnamed woman who is anointing Jesus' feet and weeping. That's not as much fun to talk about, but there is a way that you could talk about um, sexual violence if you wanted to. This, so this is what the alabaster jar looks like. Um, I got this at the Holy Land Experience in Orlando, Florida. Um, you can actually see we did a live... Bible study that doesn't suck from the Holy Land experience. Was it last Holy Week? I don't remember when it was. I just remember it was last year and it was quite fascinating. Uh-huh. Yeah. So you can yeah. get an alabaster jar there. I think this was $5. So you can get... Uh, my only recommendation is don't go to the Holy Land experience a couple weeks after the, you go to the actual Holy Land, which is what I did, and it's a bad order. Because it's kind of like Disneyland... Disneyland, where everyone in the Castro Street dresses up as biblical characters and does plays every day. That's kind of what the Holy Land experience is like. <laughs> you so, should totally publish that as a review. That's totally what it's like. So this is inside my alabaster jar. It's been upgraded for the 20th century, and you're going to totally laugh. This is awesome. So inside my alabaster jar is a little bit of perfume. It smells really, really gross. It smells like the kind of per perfume that you get inside of a magazine, actually. Oh. Uh, except that if you look at the label, it says that it's spikenard from Magdala, which I really doubt because it cost me $5. It really, I'm really got to put this away because it smells really, really bad. Um <laughs> Nard, however, and the the fragrance that was being used to anoint Jesus was the most expensive of the fragrance, fragrances that you could get. It was such a large amount because of how much it cost that it would be a ridiculously insane amount of anointing. Like, you could have anointed, like, 40 bodies with the amount of perfume. I don't know if it's really 40, but it's a... It's way more than you would ever possibly need to anoint a body. Um, and so when there is argument saying that this is a ridiculous amount of perfume, why are you wasting this? Um, there is a valid argument to be made that it is a ridiculous amount. It so it, it reminds me of um, if you have watched the Fuller House episodes on Netflix, I'm not saying I've watched them, but there is an episode where um, the teenage son is trying to put on, you know that, like, cologne stuff that on, like, men's ads, it says, like, women come flocking, and, like, one's called Swagger, and one's called, like, I don't know, Boy Funk, something like that. Max. But he's putting on so much of it because he's hoping to go on a date that they talk about him having, like, a a perfume wasp of air, kind of like pig pen as he walks down the street. And so it wouldn't just be that Jesus got anointed with oil. It would be that Jesus is noticeably perfumed everywhere that he goes after this moment. Like, you wouldn't be able to walk into the house and not smell it. 
Like, it would be super crazy obvious. It, it says the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, which, which would be a lot of perfume. A lot mm -hmm. of perfume. And um, they weren't really, like, take showers and baths kind of people, so you can imagine that Jesus was super creepy smelly for days, which is really fun. Uh, the the thing that I hate the most as someone who works with the homeless and with the poor is this line that the poor you will have forever. Many people say, oh, he just said that because he thought Judas was an idiot. Um, but I don't like that line because the Messiah's job was supposed to be to take care of the poor, to feed the hungry forever. Uh, my little commentary here from the Episcopalians, feasting on the word, um, says that it's actually a reference to Deuteronomy 15, verse 11 that says, open your hand to the poor, they will never cease to, to be some in need. So it's possible that Jesus was referring to a Bible verse or an ancient Torah verse that was, t that was supposed to say, give what you have to the poor because their need is forever, but it doesn't really come off that way as much in the way that Jesus says it in this text. Um, but this is a text that's supposed to get you ready for the fact that Jesus is going to die, that Judas is going to be a big jerk face, unless, unless you're like Pastor Dan, who I'm going to out. I'm going to out Pastor Dan as a secret Judas supporter. Pastor Dan, explain yourself. Uh, well, I, okay. <laughs> I was, I was gonna make, let me make one quick comment about women in the early church. I've had this okay. argument actually recently that... Um, uh, you know that the early church was mostly led by women. And, you know when the when the church was mostly in homes, um, when that that idea that women's place is in the home, which which is sort of a a different understanding now. A, in that time, in that period, the each home was its own business essentially. They had they had a a certain uh, something that they created or something that you know a harvest or something that they did. So if, let's say, a, a home made textiles, the woman handled the books, the woman did the hiring and firing, the woman did all of that, um, and each home was a business, and they would trade those textiles for other goods that they needed, and that's how, that's how they survived. So, you so, can imagine it if you've been to Latin America, that's a very similar thing as well, where each, the front of each home is a business, or like in um, like Brazil, where people live in stores. And, and the and then the men's the men's place with I, I think it seems to me that they didn't have much to do at that point they were in the more public sphere, well so when the church was a home church it had to have the leadership and support of the women or it wouldn't have survived and um, you look in Paul's letters when he addresses his letters it's, there's more women than men he addresses mm -hmm. um, and then when he's talking to those those house churches and that's because they were the leaders of the of the early church at that time. Which I think is, you know, tell people have them look through the, all of the prefaces to Paul, Paul's letters, and he's always addressing women. Mm -hmm. So th to think that it wasn't the it wasn't the domain of women later on is sort of sort of ludicrous. As it became more in the public eye, then then it almost because of the way their their societal structure was set up, it became men became more leaders. But um, the, to omit women for then a fifteen hundred years was sort of stupid. Uh, back to yep. my. I got it. The way it's way too smelly. <laughs> all right, back to my um, being a closet supporter of Judas. <laughs> I uh, I so kind of on a on the surface level, I think you know if if um, Jesus' death is preordained, and he needed someone to to be the catalyst for that, then Judas was essentially doing. Doing the will of God, what his what of motivations might be are, you know, we can only guess. But but that that were his own. But you know, to, to automatically demonize him when it was all part of God's plan seems seems a little unfair. And he joined. You know, there's references to him being uh, a, one of the closest friends, closest advisors to Jesus during the whole time, and um, and that. You know, well, here it talks about him um, feeding the poor. We think maybe before he was a disciple, he was actively involved in in sort of social uh, what that would have been social justice, feeding the poor, dealing with those people. A lot of them had different sorts of jobs. Some of them were were not as um, 
just as minded as others, but Judas probably was. So, so this line in this in this gospel that says um, it's verse it's verse six um, says uh, verse five says why was this perfume not sold for three hundred denarii and the money given to the poor? And then there's an editorial that's verse six. He said that he said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common person used to steal what was put into it. But the whole I, point of the common purse is that the common purse was so that when the poor needed something, you could give it to them, right? Right. Yeah. Right. And they were known for giving to the poor. They were, I mean, you know, the, there's references of that. So, did I, you know, it just seems like an unnecessary editorial stuck in there. Not that he's not, you know, that, that there's not some justification for his vilification, but I, I also think that he gets a little unfairly... Pigeonholed on something. And the Gospel of Judas, which came out as a big scandal in recent years, um, kind of made a similar argument. And there's actually a reference in the Gospel of Judas that Jesus did ask Judas to go and turn him over. Kind of this idea that he was doing what Jesus asked him to do because he needed to pass away in this certain way. Well, I think that there's there's evidence in the Gospels that, that Jesus was... That there were intentional steps for him to to go toward his death. That there was many points that he could have taken a step away, and you know that um, I read the I don't know if you read the the Dominic Crossan book the last week, which is a which is a I love Dominic Crossan a lot, and he sort of says look, on Palm Sunday, which is a week after this, which we'll talk about the 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 triumphal entry into Jerusalem was probably done around the same time that the Roman governor Pilate was coming in through a different gate in the city and it was not just this look at this peaceful celebration but it was also done to mock the Roman governor the next day probably or the next couple of days he turned over the tables in the in the temple so Jesus was very intentional about about leading to the cross and it, and it, to me it makes sense for him to 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 work with Judas so that all the pieces could fall in place. So, anyway, I'm a closet Judas lover. There you go. <laughs> what do you think, Pastor Amanda, about Judas or any of anything going on in the John reading? I'm a Judas sympathizer as well. Um, <gasps> I scandalous. Yep, scandalous, and I'm sure everyone is shocked. <laughs> but yeah, no, I I also see a lot of ways in which um, he's taken a bad rap for everyone. We need a we need a, someone to blame, um, and Judas is a convenient person to blame. And I think that there's always there are always more layers than that. So, um, what I was taking a look at also is uh, what Dan was saying about women in the early church and that kind of a piece. That's part of what I was researching last semester. There's some really fabulous books out there about the role of women in the early church and. Um, what uh, positions they held and how they participated. Um, I was actually looking at, this is one um, by an author named Elizabeth Schusler fiorenza mm -hmm. called In Memory of Her. Um, and this is a, a book, it's a feminist theological reconstruction of Christian origins. So this takes a look at the early church through the eyes of uh, feminist theology. And I was I was looking through the section about this gospel. Um, this this section where Jesus gets anointed is echoed in other gospels. It it does exist, and um, this one is unique because it is Mary who does it from Mary and Martha, as you can see in the readings that we have posted down here. If you're listening or visiting us on Blogspot, and um, so it, it, it has a little bit of a different timbre to it than some of the other foot anointings. So if you have heard of Jesus being anointed in the past, you, there's, there's multiple stories of it. And so this one is unique because it's Mary and Martha and Lazarus' house. And one of the things that's kind of interesting to know about, and this kind of takes us off in another way, but another interesting thing to know about these folks is that Mary and Martha and Lazarus were Jesus's chosen family. Like if if we think about who if you can't if you if you aren't home with your biological or 
or family of origin for Thanksgiving, who do you spend your time with? Like, mm -hmm. who would you want to have that meal with? Um, what friends would you want to be with if if you weren't going to do a traditional <clears throat> holiday with with your family of origin? So for Jesus, Bethany and and the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus was his home away from home. It was his respite place. These were his closest friends. And so it 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 shifts that it doesn't necessarily shift, but it highlights some of the, the ways their relationship functions. You know, the the freedom with which Mary and Martha come after him for not showing up when Lazarus was was dying, the um, tears that he shed at Lazarus' tomb. Um, and and I, I don't know, sometimes I wonder if the tears that he shed at the tomb were because he knew that Lazarus was already with God and of God and didn't need to worry anymore versus I'm going to make you come back and you're going to be really hated. Like Lazarus was not safe once he was risen from the dead. Mm -hmm. You know, the next the next section of, of this scripture talks about how there were people who were coming to harm Lazarus because he had been raised from the dead. So he, because he is a symbol of this power of this person, Lazarus becomes hunted. So he's not going to lead an easy life. Mary and Martha are not leading easy lives now that Lazarus is, has received this miracle. So, um, and, and there's a lot of interesting ways we can see how Mary was a disciple of Jesus, which again, that idea that women could be disciples, obviously the patriarchal culture that eventually took over um, once Constantine made it legal, so that it, you know, Mary's role is is substantial and really fascinating. So those are some of the pieces that I just wanted to pop in there. Megan, and if you've um, looked at any Last Supper depictions, um, see now I have a problem because I'm holding incense because the perfume was so gross. Okay, so I'll set it right here. If you look at any of the Last Supper depictions, including Michelangelo's Last Supper, there's always a lady. See how there's one person who doesn't have a beard? That's Mary. Well, and there's different Marys. It gets really confusing. That's not Mary of Mary and Martha. That's Mary Magdalene. That's Mary, Mary Magdalene. Magdalene. And there's, but, but the women, you know, against what people have, you know, history has said, Mary Magdalene and Mary of Bethany and Martha of Bethany are incredi incredibly present and active in the ministry of Jesus, and, and we're disciples of Christ. And we have um, lots of depictions of, of the ladies being the money people, and the, um, at the big imagery at our congregation is three women around a cross, um, and so the the idea that there's lots of different women in different parts of the stories. You might not recognize them, but if you take a second look in the artwork and in um, the stories, you can always find them in there. I, I love what you said, Amanda, about, about you know, that Mary, Martha, Lazarus look like his second family. The, the few stories um, that reference him going to, to spend time with them, it's very often the, the, the rest of the disciples aren't with him. It's sort of like they're on a break, you know, they're... They're having a sort of a weekend off to go see their families, and where he goes is there. He doesn't go to his biological family; he mm -hmm. goes there. It's usually just him. And you look at almost every other story; he has either all the disciples with him, or he has a few chosen disciples. But when he's with them, he's sort of there. Uh, so I, that sort of lends to that that that's that's where he goes when he goes home. I wanted to reference. I have two. Bo I mentioned one book, and I want to reference another book. This is one of my favorite books in seminary. When women were priests. I'm helping someone else. Karen Jo Thorgerson, really, really neat about the structure of the early church and 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 um, and and the witnesses of the during Jesus' time too that were, you know, obviously we've referenced that were some some um, amazing women. And I also mentioned Marcus Borg and Dominic Cross in the last week. So who knows? I don't generally do that sort of thing, but those are those are some of my favorite books that I read during seminary. So I'll put some links to them down here um, to the Amazon links if you're interested. Uh, yeah. 
Amanda, did you want to talk at all about modern day anointing of bodies? So I think that so this week I did a podcast um, the church basement podcast is on funerals and so we can put a link down here and we're working on getting that onto iTunes it's being reviewed right now um, but there's a whole bunch of interesting stuff about how in the United States since the advent of the funeral home industry and funeral director industry not to speak ill against funeral directors love working with them and they're awesome people and um, it could be another career for me but that that since the advent of that industry people have ceased doing the preparation of the body themselves it used to be that the preparation of the body after death was something that families did. It was very common. If you have a living room in your house, it's because there used to be a parlor, and the parlor was where you would prepare the love, your loved one and anoint them and prepare them for death and then have them out for the viewing. And then you had a living room for those who were living. So that's why we started to have funeral parlors, if you've ever heard the term funeral parlor, is because instead of a funeral home, um, is because it used to be that people would lie in state in their parlors. So the the movement away from actually tending and taking care of the physical remains of our loved ones really has not been that old of a tradition. Um, and 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 the practice of anointing or blessing someone who is either on in that thin space between life and death or has just died it can be a really really intensely sacred time um, and and there's no you don't have to do a specific way if you're Catholic you should um, but but there are multiple ways that you can go about doing this and if you are someone who wants to participate in that kind of a thing and and perhaps you have a hospice chaplain or, or a hospice service with you you can ask them about that if you have a pastor you might be able to ask them about that but even pastors have varying levels of comfort with death and some pastors might be more comfortable with this than others um, another thing that that you are you have every right to ask for you might have to pay additional unfortunately because of our industry but you have the right to ask to assist in uh, clothing your loved one for preparation for burial. You have the right to ask to view the cremation if you have um, someone who is being cremated to be present for that. Some, especially the smaller private owned funeral homes can still allow you to be present in the chamber with your loved one as you you can help to push them into the um, cremation chamber and then they'll close the door and you can push the button so you know people would say well what's what's the benefit what's the good in that um, and I'll just say that a story of someone that I have loved who's a dear friend in my family um, that I walked alongside of the family as he died very young from cancer and anointing his body um, and blessing him you know blessing the physicalness of him was a sacred time and helping to dress him in his wedding suit with his widow um, we could share stories and and she could one last time help him to be dressed and putting him into the cremation chamber when she hit that button she proclaimed that they finally beat the cancer mm -hmm. right and it it was it was a joyful that bloody cancer didn't win right like at the end it is it is God who wins mm -hmm. right so so it can seem like that would be all very morbid and our culture wants it to be morbid because our culture wants us to always want to be young and beautiful and buy everything to keep ourselves avoiding death um, but the reality is that when you enter into those practices and enter into some of those things, there's a lot of life to be found in it and some really beautiful and stunning opportunities that can assist long-term in grief 
uh, experiences. So you can hear more about that. I talked for like a full 40 minutes about it in the podcast. Amanda could talk um, for days about funerals. I could talk forever about them. I find them very fascinating and very important, and someday I'll probably write a book about them, but not yet. So they're good stuff. They're important. Uh, good well, stuff. Well, let's shift a little to the psalm because... Um, I think it's an interesting psalm. It's one of um, a, a collection of, of psalms that are known as the Songs of Ascent or Pilgrimage Songs. Um, the idea of crap turning into awesomeness kind of before your eyes because God is just that amazing that what, what previously sucketh no longer sucketh. I just think that's funny. If you've ever seen um, The Vicar of Dibley, there's a really great episode where um, they're going to be on TV with their church service, and there is a, uh, a person who assists with the worship services who's not the brightest person that ever lived, and that's kind of the joke, is that she does everything wrong all the time. And um, the historian of the congregation gets a really old, fancy-looking Bible, and it um, writes all of the S's as F's um, because that's how ye oldie handwriting was done. And so the, the person who's not so bright, when she reads the part about God sucketh, uh, pronounces the F. <laughs> Vicar of Dibley is another quite enjoyable show to watch, I'll especially for church nerds. I've never seen it, and people keep telling me I need to. So it's, wrong it's amusing. I used to think you were great, but until you said that, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's a very cool thing that happens in this text. There's this idea of weeping becoming joy. Um, what you might not know in the English translation is the kind of weeping that is talked about in the Hebrew is like sobbing, snotty weeping. Right? So it's like physical weeping rather than just crying. So it's like deep, yucky, mournful weeping. Um, and um, I, I like the, the image in the very last verse of, of the reading about, um, I don't know if it's in, yeah, in the last verse, is about, uh, well, let me just tell you what, what my, um, my book says is the literal translation of the Hebrew rather than what's in the NRSV. He walks along and weeping carries the seed bag. He will come with shouts of joy carrying his sheaves. So I love this idea, this metaphor of someone who is weeping ugly snot down their face, still taking time to plant Oh, and and knows that when the harvest comes, they will forget that they were weeping. It reminds me of um, the the cute little mem that sometimes goes around um, Twitter and Facebook. That's a uh, Martin Luther quote saying, "If I knew, if I was certain the world was going to end tomorrow, I would still plant a tree." Mm -hmm. Right, and so that this text about weeping while you're planting the harvest. Um, for me, is just a very poignant, very poignant. Well, I, I hadn't read it that way, but now, now I'm thinking. Well, what if that's sort of a, a cause and effect thing? You know, that the, the 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 actual weeping while you're carrying the seed waters the seed, and from from those times of trial, things things grow. What if what if that's where it's making that connection? That the weeping is is watering the watering the seed. I don't know that that's good farming, but sure, it's a good it's a good poem. Bad farming, good poem. That would be good my metaphor. Answer. Good, good metaphor. metaphor. Good metaphor. Yeah. But so I just like that. I like this idea. Um, Dan was telling us earlier that the watercourses in Negev um, is a place in the desert that suddenly turns into like tor torrential waters. So this really extreme opposites happening. Um, this is the kind of psalm that is fun to read when things are good. Not the kind of psalm you should read to someone who is at their worst moment. Right? So, if someone is weeping snot out of their face, <coughs> do not say to them, don't worry, plant some seed. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, incense in my throat. 
plant some seeds and have some and and weep on them and they're going to grow and you're going to be great. Don't give them a song of ascents. Don't do that. That's bad. That's bad bad pastoring. Give them a lament. Yeah, and shut up and sit next to them and love them. See, Megan and I have been doing this long enough with each other. I can go ahead and finish up where you were going with Choke that. Choke on my water. <laughs> Better than choking on snotty tears. <laughs> <laughs> See what's happened? I'm living out this pure nard because the horrible <laughs> perfume was so horrible that I had to do incense, and then the incense was so wafty it got into my throat. Now do you see how Jesus felt? Uh -huh. Jackals and ostriches. Jackals and ostriches. Does that mean you want to talk about the Isaiah text, Pastor Amanda? <laughs> did you, did you, did you. That's, that's, the, that's the leaping. <laughs> leaping? Leaping lizards! Leaping, leaping, leaping gazelles. Now I wish I had stuffed animals in my office. You Dude, need, you don't have stuffed animals in your office? You have, like, uh, random uh, things. We need to get you some toys. I have a I have a Woodstock on a Zamboni. <laughs> How is that not a toy? That is a toy. Well, I, my office is also the nursery, so there's, there's toys. Toys just on the other side of the room. Not specific stuffed animals. Oh. So, you need to do something about that. You have toys, though. See? There you go. <laughs> I just figured that that could be a fascinating way to segue us from weeping and gnashing of teeth and lament to... Uh, I'm sure that's what it was, Pastor Amanda. Isaiah. <laughs> Jackals so, and ostriches. Isaiah. Isaiah, this is not... Like, I wish <clears throat> that the Isaiah reading, if you were going to say we're going to have the poor forever, I wish the Isaiah reading was like a you better bring justice or you're no god of mine kind of Isaiah reading. Um, but sure, I suppose, alluding to the fact that God saves the Israelites from slavery is good, too. Um, and so there's references to the song that Miriam sings when everyone is drowned in the sea. Um, kind of echoes in the very first uh, verses of these texts. Um, the idea... The idea that the that the um, the pharaoh and the army are quenched like a wick makes me laugh only because every Sunday um, I struggle to use the fancy extinguisher thingy to make the candles go out, and it's not quite a perfect airless seal, and so it doesn't go out very well, and so that makes me think that's a funny joke about justice not being full in the world, but... <laughs> Just saying. Um, so I like I like the I do like the image of the gazelle. Will you make the gazelle dance again? You got to talk though, or it doesn't show you in the big screen. Oh, that's right. Pachoo, pachoo. I don't know why it's like doing pachoo sounds. I, that's <laughs> beyond my comprehension as to why. There's actually um, oh, dude, Tweety like spins on the zamboni. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> But I love the text. My favorite, there is a couple people in my congregation whose eyes light up. Um, there is a text about um, <clears throat> about birds worshiping God in one of the psalms that happened not too long ago. And I love this idea because I think birds are very gossipy and really don't talk nice very often because they're so like, did you know what so-and-so did? I'm going to tell you all. You can't get away with anything with birds. Um and so I love this idea. Whenever there's a line about a different animal worshiping God, I just love imagining that um, everything on the world has the ability to worship God. Um, and so the idea of jackals and ostriches, can you imagine how funny it would be? Why don't we have any ostriches at our congregation? Because that would be the most hysterical worship ever. And a really good poem Imagining ostriches with their head in the sand. Not that any congregations are like that. Uh, did you know that you can ride ostriches, by the way? Just total what? aside. My niece rode. Doesn't mean they like it. I, I'm just. Um, I, I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna get more serious. Sorry. Uh, Don't do it. Don't do it. I like. Verse, I like verse 19 a lot. I think it sort of, kind of. You know it. I talk probably every week about how I'm I'm both a fan of and really dislike the lectionary because sometimes we, we get um, 
we get verses that we don't want, that we don't like. Um, but oftentimes they connect really well. I love that verse 19. I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? It sort of connects to um, sort of the foreshadowing of, of what's going to happen in the gospel, I think. So um, I like that I like that line, and I like how, how the rest of the psalm leads into that and then what happens sort of after that. That's sort of the swing point of that psalm, of, of the Isaiah, rather, not the psalm. Do you think it's ever gone well for any pastor ever to preach to their congregation, I'm about to do a new thing, now it springs forth, do you not perceive it? <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't, I'm about to, I, you don't even have to say what it is. I'm about to new, new, uh, do a new thing in the congregation. Yeah. Says, <laughs> we, I'm a, I don't know if I told the story on Bible study that doesn't suck, but... Um, <laughs> My first year here at Grace, for the season of Pentecost, we talked about how the Holy Spirit brings a new way of speaking, and so we did the the um, New Zealand prayer book version of the Lord's Prayer, and I said, for the season of Pentecost, we're going to do this New Zealand Lord's Prayer, and they're like, yay, it's amazing, it makes us think. And Pastor Amanda's laughing because Pastor Amanda knows that the season of Pentecost is 23 weeks long. <laughs> I did not know that when I first did it, but I thought, this is great. They're going to get used to doing something else. About week 15, they're like, Pastor, are you done with this yet? And I was like, I said the whole season of Pentecost. It's going to be fine. Nope. Never, ever, ever again will anything other than the Lord's version of the Lord's Prayer be spoken in our space because 23 weeks of Pentecost was way too long to behold the pastor is doing a new thing so Advent Advent is a really good time to try that sort of a thing because it's only four or five weeks four weeks Lent <laughs> if you're wanting to push it because you could you could go for six and they're already feeling penitential <laughs> <laughs> but it preached really well to do it on Holy Spirit Day you can do it on Pentecost, but the I'm season I'm of Pentecost. Awesome. I said nothing but yes, 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 yes all over it. I remember. It was awesome. It rocked. It didn't wear out. It didn't pan out. It didn't pan out. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. No congregational council was excited about ever. I will disagree. There are a few that 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 that, that, that is not the case of. It, and if you are a pastor in that kind of a space, don't take it for granted. I, I am, uh, my, my the honeymoon period is still lasting for me, and I've been here a year and a half. Do everything you can. So, so don't say no. They, I, I, um, I say, hey, we should try this, and they're like, cool. That sounds neat. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that lasts as long as possible. I hope so too. I'm gonna pray for you. But I'm a toddler pastor, so they're, they're just like, ah, oh, he's, pastor, yay! He's just a kid. Isn't that adorable? He yeah. learned that in seminary. <laughs> Yay! It's so nice true. Gazelle. That gazelle is my. It looks like a bunny rabbit when it's up close, which is very fun. It is an awesome gazelle, is it not? It is. Do, okay. Do, do. What are the fun, interesting, possibly new things that you're going to be doing with your congregation? I am going to paint a hundred golf balls so they look like ladybugs and put them in the front yard so that the infant care kids can discover them and steal them. Oh, oh I was trying to figure out what, what was the purpose. but They really like ladybugs. It will make them really happy. And did you know you can get 100 golf balls for, like, really cheap? I don't so, know. So um, we, we've been doing um, Lutheran Geeks That Drink, the national uh, Geeks That Drink thing that's in a lot of pubs and stuff. Uh, um, as a church event, we go to the local pub, have a couple beers, and, and questions. It's been really fun. We went last night, uh, night before last on Monday, and the the local brewery has decided that it wasn't um, it wasn't cost effective enough, so they canceled it. And it was oh. like one sort of of really kind of fun social thing we did as a church, and now we have to find something else. So we're thinking about going bowling. Bowling. Yeah, once a month. Yeah. Good job, Martin Luther. <laughs> How does that connect with Martin Luther? Martin Luther made the most substantial change to the rules of bowling of any human being in bowling history. Because really? 
Yes. How did I know that? One of the things that I'm going to be really excited about sharing with the world during our Reformation 500 celebrations, but Martin Luther changed the number of bowling pins, and prior to Martin Luther being excited about bowling and having a bowling alley in his house, um, bowling was against church rules because it was gambling, and so Luther changed the number of pins, and he called it knocking down the devil. So with each time you rolled the ball... You rolled it to knock down the devil. Look it up. It's true. Martin Luther loves Martin. Harding. I, love, I love Luther trivia. That's awesome. I need to make a t-shirt with a Luther picture, Harding Bowling. Yes. Um, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to bring that up to church. So definitely, Lutheran geeks would go bowling. <laughs> and there's beer there too. So beer. We can, it's perfect. Again, very Lutheran. Yes. Yeah. Very fun. Amanda? What are we doing that's new? and doing something fun or anything? What we're doing that's new and risky is we have a deficit budget this year on purpose. What? And it's very risky because we're actually talking about finances and money and being realistic with how we want to do so much more than what we can afford. All right, pastors, straw poll, raise your hand if you think the most risky thing your congregation can do is tell the truth to each other. Boom. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what we're doing that's new and risky and is pretty awesome and inspiring, and I'm really proud of them. And it's not going to be easy um, because they're going to have to talk about finances regularly to recognize how things are going. So we were projected to be at negative 7,000 by now, and we're only at negative 2. So <laughs> it's not, you know, I mean, it's a like a negative $40,000 budget that we have planned. So at that rate... We're, yeah, neg we'll we're negative 15 this year because we didn't lie about how much the the congregation was going to give this year for the first time. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it, so, I mean, that's new and risky. Not saying, like, so we want to increase this line item, and so we're just going to say that the giving is going to increase by a latte a week. Um, you know, it instead of saying that, we're just like, no, we want to increase this line item, and we know that our giving last year was this much. Mm-hmm. So yep. here's what our projected deficit is, and Good on you. let's go with it. So that's the new risky thing that we're doing. I just I actually talked with uh, with Megan earlier about how um, our the the church I'm I'm at is um is very much a dying church. the The congregation wouldn't be offended if I said that. Um, they basically have said I have a term call. I have two years. I have a two year call because that's basically how much money they have to pay a pastor. Once two years are up. They're they're done, and so it's really um, a lot of um, as, especially as a toddler pastor, a lot of responsibility in okay, how do we really turn this thing around? So giving uh, the last years uh, went up twenty percent, and then seventeen percent forecast for this year, um, but yeah. we're also we're also forecasting an almost pretty similar to you, Amanda, forty forty three thousand dollars shortfall this year, and. Um, one of the most amazing things that happened over all these discussions, what, because they're because they called the full-time pastor the first time in several years, me, um, that um, pretty conservative member of the church council back in October, um, I said, you know, well, we've gone from from sixty thousand dollars budgeted expenses to nearly a hundred thousand, and that's not very much for even a small church. Um, and I said, you know, we're going to have a shortfall, and he said. You know, he had been always sort of on the well. We don't want to spend too much. We want to cut. And he says, "Well, I'd like it if we get to 120, mm. because that means we're doing more in the community. That means we're reaching out. That you know, not just do the minimum to pay for a pastor and do the minimum right. to pay the bill, but, but go grow beyond that." And I kind of went, "That's awesome." You know, for someone that had also that has been sort of pulling back so much to say some of that was so faithful. So it was pretty neat. Yay, congregations! Woo woo! So these are the things that pastors also talk about. Mm -hmm. But I do think that Bible study that doesn't suck is over for this week. It is. It's totally over. You made Thanks it for joining us. What, what? Jackals and gazelles. Jackals and ostriches and gazelles. That's right. And Tweety Birds. Turtles. Bye. Anyway, I love you lots. Take care. Goodbye. Peace out.